Anna O'Malley, welcome to the new school. It's great to be here. Anna, you are a, a friend of uh, many years, probably eight years now. Um, you are a physician for, uh, for me and my family and uh, many of us in West Moran. Um, and um, you are now doing some very creative work um, in the Commonweal Garden. Mm -hmm. um, and um, really, we should record the fact that you're not only a physician with Coastal Health Alliance, you've been uh, with Coastal Health Alliance for eight years and living in Bolinas for almost four years in May. Um, but you're really a beloved physician in West Marin. And, um, um, and you bring not only your tools as a, a family practice physician, but you've studied uh, integrative medicine at Andy Wiles uh, Center in Arizona. And so you bring this integration of uh, standard medicine and integrative medicine together, which is, of course, very much at the heart of our work at Commonweal. So um, there are so many places we could start, but um, when you suggested um, the title, The Ecology of Community Medicine, why did you suggest that title? Well, I, I care very much about community and about the interrelatedness of us all and, and how that informs our health. And I've been thinking a lot about what it means to engage in community and how we can actually use community as medicine, not just practicing medicine within the community, but actually intentionally creating the space, the containers in which people experience deep connection, community, and that actually facilitates healing. And, and thinking about the notion of, of an ecological framing of health that really considers all of the ways that we are related to systems, you know, as, as we think about ecology and being natural beings within natural systems, about our relationship with the earth, with our food, with the land, with the community, and with each other. Uh, so, so that really does inform a lot of the things that I've been thinking about in the programs that I've been developing. And it's, it's really at the core of how I approach every one-on-one -on -one office visit, you know, how, how, what's going on within your life, how are you held, how are you not held, how can you be held, and how can, how can we uh, work with those relationships to um, affect health. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the two programs that you're doing now where you're actually seeing patients in the garden at Commonweal. Mm -hmm. So, so seeing patients mm -hmm. in the in the garden, I am working with the Coastal Health Alliance patients within the yurt mm -hmm. as uh, doing depth integrative medicine group visits. Mm -hmm. So I've been trained by Andrew Weil to do integrative medicine to really uh, use food and lifestyle and really. Uh, at its core, believing deeply that we as human beings have the ability, if supported with the right nourishment and the right situation, that we can actually heal our bodies. Our bodies have what they need to heal. And so uh, it, is, it is difficult within the typical system, the 20-minute office visit, to really get to the depth of empowerment that I hope to achieve with people and to really give them the tools that they can take charge of their own health. And so the lovely thing about doing groups is that I satisfy my productivity requirements, <laughs> which is important to many, mm -hmm. uh, but that I'm able to, to, more importantly, bring people together in a circle in which we can have the time, we have the luxury of two and a half hours to go through, you know, to, to bring, weave people together, hear what people's experience is, bring them into a circle, and then have a you know half an hour talk on on one particular system. So it's it's structured around one particular topic that's that is a shared interest, like say gastrointestinal health. So people who have various GI issues come together. Cardiovascular health and wellness. Tomorrow we're doing women's health um, on Valentine's Day, and so, <laughs> as a Valentine to women everywhere. Um, and, and so really bringing people together with a shared interest and then empowering them with information about how their body works, which 
I believe strongly that everybody, you know, not just doctors, should hold the information about how our bodies work because our bodies are incredible and, and they can heal if we give them the right, right thing. And so, uh, and then really this is at its core breaking out into dyads, into pairs, so people can make it real for themselves. This is so important. You know, you can have all this information wash over you, but until it becomes real and relevant to your own life, it's, it doesn't really translate into behavior change. Mm. And so people spend time together, and there's, some, there's, there's a beautiful thing that happens when two people sit down and, and talk about, wow, here's what's going on for me, and here's how I've been affected by my inability to sleep, and here's what might, might be at its core in my life, hearing what I just heard. Like, maybe I should consider skipping the nightcap that I have, or whatever it is. And then coming back into the circle and, and stating atten- intentions aloud, going around the circle. And you know, there's something really special that happens when you're supported by a group of people and, and encouraged to articulate what it is that you're going to do differently mm-hmm. and then follow up. So that's, that's the depth integrative medicine mm-hmm. group visits. And we're doing those twice a month. And they're for Coastal Health Alliance patients right now, but I I really see this as being central to something that could kind of unlock this really difficult situation right now within medicine. That is, you know, people feel rushed. We don't get to depth. We are losing our sense of connection with patients. And and so I am hoping to open this up to, you know, beyond Coastal Health Alliance patients. To say nothing of the burnout of physicians and healthcare providers. Uh, we were talking before we started uh, about the burnout rate and uh, the suicide rate, especially among women physicians. Mm-hmm. What is the burnout rate now? Fifty-five percent. Uh-huh. You know, it's 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 staggering, and it and if I uh, if I really think about it, you know, it, it the emotion is right below the surface for me because it's so it's so real and it's so yeah. tragic, yeah. and and we are a precious resource. Yeah. You know, we are our health is we are not achieving really good health right. uh, with our within right. our system, and we really need this precious, well-trained, deep-hearted resource to not be burned out. Mm-hmm. And every year, that rate goes higher. And there's, there's nothing really different about the, the people who are going into medicine. Mm-hmm. People who go into medicine are resilient human beings mm-hmm. who have a deep heart, who want to make a difference, who care, and who are dedicated. But the system around the, in which we are functioning is changing in ways that aren't honoring of the preciousness of, of the humans who are doing this beautiful healing work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a human being, as I... As I counsel my patients, I, we, are not, we are not designed to sit in front of a computer screen for 14, 15 hours a day. We're just not. And it's not healthy to work until midnight or one because you've got such a staggering amount of bureaucratic administrative tasks that you can't do when you're seeing 20 patients a day. And I'm fortunate. You know, I'm not seeing 30 patients a day the way some primary care providers are. And so, you know, it's... it's you see 20? On a busy day, I see 20. On an average day, I see between 16 and 18. And, and many people in this room know that I am uh, significantly challenged to stay on time. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I care greatly about doing, about listening, about relationship, and about really hearing people's stories and, and counseling them on, on what they, what, how they need to be held. And, and what steps they need to take. And 20 minutes or even you know, 10 or 15 by the time the medical assistant has done everything that they're supposed to do, you know, it's, it's just enough time in many, unless you take the time or, uh, to, to really uh, throw pills at symptoms. You know? And we have an, an unfortunate situation within our system right now. And, and some people would say that systems are set up perfectly to achieve that which they're set up to achieve. And we have a chronic disease management system right now that is incentivized around pharmacologic interventions and downstream interventions that are extremely costly. And the device makers and the pharmaceutical industry, is very, they're very happy with the current situation. But we know that our health outcomes are very poor. Mm-hmm. And we also know that we have we we know how to achieve upstream interventions. You know, integrative medicine, just basic good medicine, mm-hmm. which is you know family medicine. The way I was trained, we we honor the importance of 
food and of lifestyle and sleep and relationship, love, interconnectedness, all of these things that we know, now we're learning this beautiful science is being elaborated now that we know that we can turn genes on and off, like Dean Ornish's work so beautiful, that, that we actually know that with making certain choices about behavior, that we can actually reverse or prevent chronic disease in the first place, which is a lot less expensive. Mm-hmm. And you know, the, the, the cost, the human suffering that, that we are allowing to perpetuate, um, it's, it's staggering. You know, we could do a lot better. You mentioned the commodification of medicine. And um, when we were talking before, um, just how real health care, it's very difficult to commodify it. You know, it's, um, But you also mentioned, along with commodification, um, um, the healing. You just talked about love. And you uh, just said that you're going to do a... Uh, a, a gathering on a women's health in honor of Valentine's Day. And so um, you and I are both interested in the healing power of love. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something we've both given a lot of thought to. Um, but at a, a very fundamental level, um, what do we know about the biochemistry of the healing power of love? It's, it. I, I love when science and spirituality mm-hmm. and the the mystical ephemeral mm-hmm. intersect. You know, and this mm-hmm. is this is such a beautiful mm-hmm. illustration mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. That so we know that when when we are, you know, attuned to people like you and I right now, mm-hmm. making mm-hmm. eye contact, mm-hmm. leaning toward each other, like mm-hmm. really deeply listening. Mm-hmm. And we have, you know, mutual positive regard for each mm-hmm. other. So we yeah. are experiencing love. Like mm-hmm. right now, mm-hmm. what's happening within our mm-hmm. brain is that mm-hmm. we are releasing oxytocin mm-hmm. because we are we are responding to each mm-hmm. other. Mm-hmm. There's no threat here. And oxytocin has this beautiful effect on, on the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that is responsible for that parasympathetic the opposite of the fight or flight response, Mm -hmm. which is, depending on how you frame it, rest and digest, or uh, calm and connect. And, And so what that does is it has a harmonizing effect on the heart, and this neuropeptide, oxytocin, has all sorts of effects on the brain where it it helps us to feel connected with each other. It's the it's the hormone of bonding. It's the same one that's released when, when people are falling in love with their newborn baby and, and are nursing their baby, uh, making love, all of these things that, that um, where people are experiencing connection, oxytocin is released. And it helps us to see that there's no separation here, that, mm-hmm. you know, that we are all one, mm-hmm. that uh, we can trust each other. We don't have to put gar- guards up. And, uh, and it's, and it, also turns on genes that are associated with um, longevity. It decreases cortisol. It decreases inflammation. We know that inflammation is the final common pathway of a lot of different disease states. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, on a on a cellular level, it's good for our health. And on a societal, on a community level, it helps us really weave these these bonds of connection with each mm-hmm. other and within the community. And it helps, you know, it's hard to be in love when you're when you're feeling fear and anxiety and and conversely experiencing love helps diminish fear and anxiety and you know it's it's something that I've been thinking a lot about right now you know that that this is it's relevant for us to be really thinking about that love is it's not just something this romantic notion not just you know we experience on valentine's day when we give you know valentine to our our beloved but that it's actually something that that every single that that we can experience you know with, within friendship within you know even even you know being open to having to making eye contact and smiling with someone on the street, you know mm-hmm. that that's a little burst of oxytocin that goes a long way mm-hmm. on a cellular level and on a societal level. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, you mentioned uh, again before we began that um, that in traditional Chinese medicine, that winter is a time uh, where 
addressing both fear and resilience is is appropriate. Could you say a little more about that? Sure. So, so that was within, and and I know that there are people here in this room. I am not a traditional Chinese mm-hmm. medicine doctor, but I, I. It resonates very much with me, as does Ayurveda, the, the, the honoring of the cyclical nature mm-hmm. of our natural beings mm-hmm. and the natural world and the way mm-hmm. in which we can bring ourselves into attunement and resonance with mm-hmm. the natural world. And that's that's indeed what we are working with, with the Art of Vitality program, the mm-hmm. other of the two programs that you mentioned that I'm doing within the garden. Mm-hmm. And we are working, you know, we're moving through, we started with autumn and then we just had our winter weekend and many people mm-hmm. here were part of that beautiful weekend. And then we'll have a, a spring and summer weekend. And and so in winter, you know, when, when it's the dark time and where, you know, we as, as human beings, you know, we have this, this whole legacy, this, this, evolutionary legacy where where there have been times where we have faced scarcity and many many humans still do face scarcity but you know the winter time is is the time where you, know, you have to store up that that we have to we might not make it through the winter sort of a thing and so so fear has always been a part of that you know in, in our animal and darkness and darkness yeah mm-hmm, exactly mm-hmm. and so so we spent a lot of time uh, within we, we've been really minding and cultivating and weaving this beautiful container within this Art of Vitality weekend uh, program. And in which people feel held so that we can let go and surrender into this process of inquiry. Like, what does it mean to be in stillness? What does it mean to be working with with sh- shadow elements of ourself or, or um, outside of ourselves? And to go deeply into those places where where we have fear, and to see what sort of practices we can bring to that, um, looking at death, you know, looking at death, both our fear of death and and what our cultural legacy around fear of death has has become, and and really seeing how we can uh, maybe bring curiosity and through the resilience that we experience within this this container, uh, be held in thinking about our own mortality. Mm. And so so this weekend we we did spend some time, we did a, a fear meditation basically, or a journaling exercise basically, of just like spending five minutes, five minutes alone with your pen and a piece of paper and just, I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of, and just, you know, letting it out. And it's, you know, in February of 2017, it's a powerful time for us to be thinking about what are our fears? And what have we been told to fear? What are we, what's in there for whatever reason that we might fear? And how can we maybe start to um, untie some of those energetic knots or loosen them mm. by being held and, and in a resilient container? You know, you touch on so many of the central themes of Commonweal's work, and I just want to reflect them back to you. One is, one is the healing power of love, and really that's at the heart of the Commonweal Cancer Help Program. We just finished our 193rd week-long Cancer Help Program mm-hmm. yesterday. And again, eight people came from across the country. And, um, and in the course of a week, what happens is that eight people fall in love with each other. Mm -hmm. They've never met each other before. Mm -hmm. They're very different. But in the course of a week, in the face of the shared threat of cancer, Mm -hmm. um, they fall in love with each other. And uh, they also often find it within themselves to love themselves more. And loving each other and loving themselves more gives people courage. And uh, the courage to face whatever fears we have, whether it's cancer or, you know, any other situation or the political situation that many people feel fear about, um, uh, love is actually an unbelievably powerful force to face fear. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, in fact, Jerry Jampolsky's book from the Center for Attitudinal Healing, this amazing guy who started the Center for Attitudinal Healing, and Tiburon at the same time we started Commonweal here. And his central book, based on The Course of Miracles, which was his seminal text, is called Love is Letting Go of Fear. And that's Mm -hmm. his line. Mm -hmm. Love is letting go of fear. Mm -hmm. And so that experience, when one experiences deep love, 
is that somehow you can let go of fear, mm -hmm. even deep fear, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and the power of that, I mean, you talked about oxytocin and all the wonderful biochemical things it does, but at the experiential level, uh, it is the most powerful response to fear. So when we find ourselves in a period of time, and I want to honor all perspectives because politically it's so important to recognize that there are large groups of people in this country who felt as left out as many of us feel now mm -hmm. and who are celebrating now mm -hmm. and bless them because mm -hmm. they are trying to find a way that works for them. Mm -hmm. But for many of us, there's this enormous sense of fear. Mm -hmm. And I know I've been struggling with it. It's not as if I know how to deal with this. Mm -hmm. um, in the cancer health program, by the way, we leave politics at the door mm -hmm. because like an emergency room physician, an emergency room physician doesn't ask what political party you're. So if you're doing healing work, mm -hmm. it's important, it seems to me, if you're doing medical healing work to leave politics at the door. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, what you were doing a healing circle with Mm -hmm. which we do healing circles that have grown out of the cancer help program. If, on the other hand, and we've done this, that Oren Slosberg, our chief strategies officer, has been leading intergenerational dialogues, where we focus on people's feelings about the particular fear of the political situation, and when you get to express those fears and hear from others about the very different ways that they are holding this situation, then very often there's a shift in the level of fear and there's a diminishment of fear and suffering and one comes into this bonded relationship of trust that you talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, fear is, is diminished. So uh, and the third thing that uh, you, you've touched on is the relationship of your integrative medicine to the ecological paradigm of health. And here are our colleague Ted Shetler, Dr. Ted Shetler. Ted, where are you in the room? Oh, there he is. Uh, Ted uh, is really the person in the Collaborative on Health and the Environment at Commonweal, who's really, I won't say invented the ecological paradigm of health, because it has many precursor, you know, ideas. Um, but he has, in our community, been driving the ecological paradigm of health and has written uh, this book called The Ecology of Breast Cancer, which is an extraordinary study of breast cancer specifically. So. These ideas that you're working with, you know, the original founding idea of Commonweal was that this place for 41 years has been about healing ourselves and healing the earth. Yeah. And that is precisely what you're about. Mm -hmm. And the healing power of love is absolutely central to healing both ourselves and healing the earth. Mm -hmm. And not in, as you say, not in some, you know, uh, fluffy, woo-woo, uh, you know, fake mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. but the actual healing power of love, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which has driven, you know, many of the great religious and spiritual traditions for 2,000 years or more, had the insight mm -hmm. that, you know, that love heals. Um, so, um, so all of these themes that you're working with are, are central to our work, and we are so honored and grateful that you are now in the Commonweal Garden, which has been in the care of James Stark and Penny Livingston Stark for the last 10 years. And, um, uh, and uh, James is co-directing the uh, program on uh, vitality with you. James, welcome back to the new school. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, just to kind of change the voice for a minute, uh, what does... Uh, what does working with Anna in the Art of Vitality program mean for you? What's your experience of it? Well, I grew up as a Canadian, mm -hmm. and health and healing, as we know, is a different ecology in mm -hmm. Canada yeah. than it is here. And so it's been one of the major challenges I've had is uh, living in America, mm -hmm. living in a corporate health care system. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I met Anna um, and reaching this fourth quarter of my life, mm -hmm. one of the unresolved things for me in this community is I haven't really contributed to transforming the healthcare system mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. 
And uh, when I went to, uh, I had a tick bite and I went to the doctor and I had the experience of Anna really uh, feeling what it'd be like to uh, go to a village medicine doctor mm-hmm. where somebody who really, I felt her heart involved in addressing me. And um, so in the work that we've been doing in the garden, I could just see we need, we need to have the garden really focus on healing. And so I put an invitation out to Anna, can you come to the garden and have tea and we could talk about how you might be in the garden. And she said, well, I have two kids and a family and work till two in the morning doing this on the computer. Um, Come back later. (laughs) And um, so I came back a year later because it kept, the idea kept burning in my heart and the desire to do something and make a contribution that way. And it really formed a perfect time because you couldn't take any more patients and maxed at that level and and said, yeah, let's have tea and talk about it. And that's how we began the conversation about how can we bring villagers together and move the healthcare from a one-on-one lone wolf and the doctor model to us coming together and taking responsibility for our own health and healing and having the doctor facilitate our healing process together and break that that isolation that we often feel, and I think Anna has data about how many people really have people they can turn to about their health, you know, mm-hmm. and how little um, the relationship with the doctor has to do with our health and well-being. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. such a minimal part. So. so before we turn the camera away from you again and back to Anna, talk a little bit about your experience of the Oda Vitality program itself. Well, because we have been doing programs that have to do with how do we heal our inside so that we can be free and powerful on the outside. Mm -hmm. And so coming together with Anna to um, have us begin to open up to one of the most precious, delicate parts of us, like how we look after Mm ourselves. And uh, to open that up and actually share with others. And, and one of the things that we haven't touched on yet is deep nature connection. Hmm. Is, is uh, like when we look at the big picture and, and politically we need to look at the big picture. And the big picture is we need to get into that harmonic of the planets and this unfolding. 13.7 billion year unfolding. And... Because we are nature. And without deep connection, without our senses being attuned to our larger body, how much, how can we really be vital and healthy and whole? So, us doing the program and balancing between Anna bringing depth, understanding about how do you actually look after yourself? What's a, how do you make the decision to eat the carrot and not the donut? <laughs> And then go running to Anna and say, "Fix me." Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? um, so that adding that wisdom about like what is this, and I think what Anna does because of the love and the deep connection and understanding of the body, she <clears throat> allows us to appreciate fully appreciate the awe and wonder. Oh my God, I've got a human body, and it's amazing. What does it want? What's it telling me? How is it communicating with me? Do I, do I even listen to my body? You know, do I override it? So all this is, you know, in some ways, I like to, to generate programs that I like to sit in. <laughs> and, and, and this has been a dream of mine to, to have somebody who has the wisdom of an understanding about the body and then uh, weaving in deep nature connection and demonstrations and how we feed it and it's kind of like we we don't have a manual for how to operate you know how to keep this thing and it's so beautiful to begin to think oh maybe the most precious thing my top priority is 
is maintaining the vitality of this, and then maybe that's how we grow ourselves into a whole new ecology on the planet. Which is also at the heart of permaculture. It's, that you take care of the soil first, that you, yeah. take, you regenerate the soil, and then the rest of it takes care of itself. That you have to nourish the, the, root. the roots first. Yeah. And that, that's how the program for me, and, and Penny and I have been there for 13 years, mm -hmm. and doing the different spokes of ecological living, and this is kind of like the, the, the pinnacle of it, where we really delve deeply into. So how do we get that bacteria that's in the soil that we now, through science, understand that that bacteria that's in the soil is the bacteria we need in our gut? You know, rather than trying to wash it and disinfect it and clean it and sterilize everything around us, we need to be consuming and integrating and breathing because we came out of the forest, we came out of the soil, and, and how do we return to that? And That's so beautiful. Senses. Thank you very much. And again, before I go back to Anna, Ted Shetler, uh, I, you're, you're in the room with us, and one of our beloved colleagues, uh, you're the science director of the Collaborative on Health and the Environment, and you've thought a lot about these issues. You were an ER physician yourself for a long time before you decided to involve yourself in this environmental health and justice work. As you listen to this conversation, which is a kind of an embodiment of what you're talking about, about the ecological paradigm of health, what, what does it evoke for you? Well, I, I'm thinking all the time about how this is a, a, a bi-directional arrow. We've been talking a lot about how when Anna sees patients, the focus is obviously on, on the health and well-being of that, that person, and then you've moved into this group work, which has been very effective. But I also think about how those same experiences and pathways and so on reflect back on the health of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what our responsibility in that direction is, because there are so many of us on the planet now, and we're clearly mistreating the planet in so many ways. And James and Penny's uh, project in the garden and the permaculture you were just talking about is acknowledging that. And think, but I'm thinking about how do we apply that more broadly? Mm -hmm. How do we take these experiences uh, and, 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 and reflect them back on the earth? I don't think we have any choice. Mm -hmm. I think it's an imperative actually that we make the reconnect mm -hmm. medicine with public and environmental health. And if we don't, Re-establish these connections. I think it's at our peril, mm -hmm. but the peril of a lot of mm -hmm. other species as well. So that's a dynamic that I'm just sort of wrestling with. As Thank I, you. As I listen to Anna talk. And you know, it's so interesting because a lot of the time, when people talk about how we need to reconnect to the earth and so on, it's a fear dynamic. It's if we don't do that, the climate's going to change and we're going to be filled with toxic chemicals and. We're specialists in, in all those fearful things. But we also know, both in lifestyle change and in uh, planetary change, that people don't do lasting change out of fear. It doesn't work. You know, If somebody has a heart attack and they start the Ornish program out of fear, they won't stay on it for very long. They have to reach a point where they're on this because it makes them feel better and because they love life and love themselves. And so it comes back to the central theme of the healing power of love. Mm -hmm. So as you've listened to James and Ted, where, where does it kind of take you on it in your thinking? Well, I, I believe very passionately in the importance of reconnecting with our love, actually, mm -hmm. of, of the earth and of mm -hmm. nature. And uh, and I, I want to speak in a, in a moment about the way I see permaculture, like looking through the lens of permaculture and mm -hmm. applying that to medicine and healing. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think, speaking to, to Ted's point, I think one of the most important things that we can do is get our children out into nature mm -hmm. and allow them to have the free, unsupervised, delighted discovery process of just connecting with nature because it is it is so important i mean it's it's formative there's beautiful data demonstrating how important that is for a child's well-being to be held in nature to to be operating from that place of curiosity and discovery and if a child has that experience 
they they are much more likely to go on to do you know the it's an interesting Richard Louvre writes beautifully on this you know within the the uh, nature deficit disorder the last child in the woods and uh, you know he he really has done a lot of thinking and writing on this and that within his writing he points to the fact that the vast majority of brilliant thinkers those who are who are uh, articulate or recognized for being, you know, these seminal thought leaders or brilliant individuals, like on Einstein level, that they all set aside time to go reconnect to nature. They would take walks in the forest, and they all had pointed to deep nature connection within their childhood as a base, a foundation. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so. So it's it's I mean and, and for many of us who've had this I mean I, I personally make make time to go out and be in nature and reconnect as, as frequently as I can and it's often there especially if I'm navigating any sort of a crossroads you know that's the time to go be in relationship with my special tree that I you know what I have I have many relationships with special trees who have been there for me and and to really allow insight and, and wisdom to just bubble up. It happens if you're open to it. And especially if you've had those formative experiences in childhood where you, you just have that relationship. So I think that that's really important. I think that you know, if it, if it doesn't happen in, in childhood, we know, I mean, we're talking, it's again, talking about love, that you experience this dear love for, for the animals, for the, for the trees, you feel held, you know, it's just, and, and if you don't have that experience in childhood, that's okay, it's not too late, you can cultivate love, we know that love happens, mm -hmm. uh, you can, you can have these, you can cultivate it, and it still bubbles forth, you can have an oxytocin release by, mm -hmm. you know, and, and here, this might be going into the new agey realm, but by hugging a tree, you know, but then like be, bringing yourself into a dear relationship by connecting with your heart and being in gratitude for all that the earth provides brings you into the love. And, and that is a different framing than what often happens within um, the e ecological framing of medicine, which is all of the unfortunate toxicity that's gone into the earth and how that's impacting us. And mm -hmm. And I think, again, this is important thinking about kids. You know, my, my children, I, my eldest is in first grade. And her, well, she's very fortunate because her, her parents are very intentional about giving her opportunities to be out in nature from, from her infancy. She's, you know, her first experiences with nature have been about discovery, delight, the, the sensual pleasure of, you know, feeling grass on bare feet, etc. But many people, many kids these days, their first exposure to nature is that nature is being destroyed and the earth is being destroyed and there's plastic in the ocean and the polar bears are dying. And, you know, it's all of this, like, it's really intense for kids to have that be what they're exposed to at a tender young age. And so I, I think that it's really, really, really important for us to do everything that we can to get kids out into nature and adults out into nature and really be mindful of the deep medicine that happens there. I want to uh, shift um, to learning more about you. Where were you born? In Edina, Minnesota. Is that a rural or urban area? <laughs> Well, I, uh, that's where the hospital was, which is this um, suburban area. Mm -hmm. And I, but I grew up in a, a rural area in Rosemont, Minnesota. What kind of family did you grow up in? I have two younger sisters mm -hmm. and um, two lovely parents. Mm -hmm. And we lived in a, a little neighborhood with a beautiful forest nearby and a wonderful climbing tree. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a very... Uh, outdoor, nature-connected experience mm -hmm. within a very secure, loving container. Mm -hmm. and um, Did your cats. parents work? My dad worked and my mm -hmm. mom stayed home. What did he do? He worked for the Toro uh, Lawnmower Company and he was mm -hmm. the, the operations mm -hmm. manager of the parts mm -hmm. department. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it's an old Quaker question. When did you first know that God loves you? What a beautiful question. Well, I 
went to church every Sunday. I was mm -hmm. raised in a, a Christian home, mm -hmm. Lutheran, evangelical Lutheran, mm -hmm. not any other sort. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I felt deeply connected mm -hmm. to love and the stories of Jesus going mm -hmm. to Sunday school. You know, I really enjoyed learning about the life of mm -hmm. Jesus. But I would say that the mystical, ineffable experience happened probably around the age of seven or eight, hmm. being in, I would, I would regularly go out into the forest um, mm -hmm. that was close to us by myself and just being in meditation. And I, I remember two, two particular times where I was in really just very prayerful, meditative sort of moments of being in a, a, in a grassy glade and just, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think what I was really trying to do was be still and loving enough that a bunny would hop over close mm -hmm. to me. <laughs> Remember that, like I wanted to attract an animal to me. Um, and also the snow being in the, in the silence of, of, a, mm -hmm. of a snowy forest and just feeling so mm -hmm. connected to it all mm -hmm. and knowing that that was God. What were you like in eighth grade? <laughs> eighth grade, I was on the verge. From whose perspective? My own. Perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, from my own perspective, I was really uh, kind of flexing my own identity and uh, was very, very studious. I mean, I've always been a very mm -hmm focused, uh, driven, mm -hmm. achievement-oriented, mm -hmm. enneagrammatic type one sort of a <laughs> gal. <laughs> Served me well for the most part. Um, but I, I also have a, had a real uh, adventurous and mm -hmm. rebellious mm -hmm. streak and had parents who were Fairly, actually, I mean, in retrospect, they, they did a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. But uh, my experience at that time and through uh, probably age 16, 17 was that they were trying to control me a little bit too much. And so mm -hmm. I was, you know, almost, I, w I don't know if I'd qualify for oppositional defiant, but I was, mm -hmm. I was sassy. <laughs> <laughs> and what were you like as a senior in high school? I think by the time that I was a senior in high school that I was fairly mature mm -hmm. and ready to go out into the world mm -hmm. and see what was next and you know, get, in, get into a new phase of being. But, you know, it's interesting. I, I lost connection with nature for a while, mm -hmm. when I when I moved from Minnesota to Wisconsin, when I was twelve, and really I think was somewhat captivated by the the work of, of being an adolescent, which mm -hmm. is to to find your way with mm -hmm. your peer group and mm -hmm. to find how you fit in. And uh, it is something that I, I hope that my kids don't lose mm -hmm. that connection because if you if you lose your connection with that connection that to, to source, really, to the spiritual mm -hmm. source that I've, I've found there, uh, you know, you can find you can find connection other ways. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I was very, I, I did a lot of experimenting. Let's mm -hmm. say that. Yeah. And and I'm glad I did. Yeah. And I'm glad it turned out okay. But. Um, and what were you like as a senior in college? Senior in college. I've been thinking a lot. Well, I have thought a lot about how. How when you are pre-med, mm -hmm. you can... And you were pre-med. And I was pre-med. Mm -hmm. And I was very future-oriented. This very was college goal -oriented. Where? where? were you? University of Wisconsin in Madison. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, was, I, I think the majority of my, my life was really structured around... Mm -hmm. What's next? Like, what mm -hmm. am I preparing myself for? The mm -hmm. MCAT, the application test, mm -hmm. my, my application to medical school, um, and and just achieving and being on that trajectory really since seventh grade is when I identified that I wanted to become a doctor. And so that future fo focus, without uh, really any sort of a meditative practice mm -hmm. or a, an appreciation of the importance of a mindful mm -hmm. presence mm -hmm. in the actual moment in which we are living, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it really got me 
Mm, how would I say this? I I don't think I was as present to the the reality mm-hmm. of my my relationship. For example, I married my high school sweetheart. Again, mm-hmm. another achievement mm-hmm. oriented. Like, mm-hmm. okay, got that checked mm-hmm. off the list. The relationship is settled. You know, mm-hmm. dear man, and I. You know, we had a, a very beautiful love in many ways, but we weren't meant to be married to each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think that when I was a senior in college, I was, you know, I, I, I had a, I had dear friendships and I, and mm-hmm. I studied hard and I really enjoyed mm-hmm. going out and, and going to live mm-hmm. music events mm-hmm. and really exploring that sort of, that cultural uh, milieu of festivals and consciousness expansion and mm-hmm. you know ecstatic experiences mm-hmm. in that realm and which counterbalanced the extreme focus and long hours at the library. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Where did you go to medical school? The Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. So you stayed in Wisconsin mm-hmm. for a while. Mm-hmm. And after that? And then I did residency at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF. Mm-hmm. And when did you do the Andy Weil program? After the residency? After the residency. And then did you come out to Coastal Health Alliance at that point? Didn't you do some other work first? Yep. So I, I spent three years at San Francisco General, mm-hmm. which was really formative. Mm-hmm. You know, that that was, uh, oh, I love that place. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful You care place to a be. lot about low income communities and getting health care to them. I care a lot about access and loving yeah. all people. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that I, that's, I have a very, very strong service orientation. And I think that part of it has to do with, you know, what, the way I was brought up and that, uh, that a lot of the beauty of the stories of Jesus Christ really got in there. And, mm-hmm. and I carry that with me, that serving mm-hmm. the poor and serving all people with great heart, mm-hmm. without any judgment or regardless of their ability mm-hmm. to pay, is very important, powerful, beautiful mm-hmm. work. Uh, and so, yeah, working at San Francisco General was a beautiful place to just mm-hmm. learn about what happens in poverty and what happens with addiction and and just showing up as strong as you can in love and service and and with with the applying intellect and dedication and service uh, to loving work and that's that's quite a place to do it mm-hmm. and when you went to Andy Wiles integrative medicine mm-hmm. uh, program what was the impact of that on your thinking? Obviously, you had been trained in, in standard medicine. What, was, what impact did that have on you? I think that, well, it's, uh, I'll answer it in two ways. One, one was that coming out to Northern California mm-hmm. for residency mm-hmm. was, was a, a very impactful experience. And really, mm-hmm. uh, I, was, I was curious about integrative medicine, and in fact, one of the reasons that I wanted to come to Northern California was I wanted to be within that sort of a milieu where people really were interested in well-being and, and prevention and had rotated through various clinics where that was being practiced. Uh, so that was the initial opening. And when I, was, when I started the fellowship um, in Andy Wells' program, I was actually doing work in the prison. My first job out of residency was to, this was in the, the wake of the federal receivership that mm-hmm. was found that the, the care being provided within the C, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation was unconstitutionally poor mm-hmm. and that people were dying and, and people were unfit to be medical providers who were providing care. And so uh, UCSF came was a, a consultant to the CDCR and I was part of that effort. And so, mm-hmm. so as I was working within, I would go on site to a women's institution down in Chino Hills, California, Southern California, uh, working with women for a week at a time and with the providers taking care of them. I had this opportunity to apply for a Brave Well Fellowship, which is a full scholarship. And so, so I was working within you know, this, this particular patient population, not so different from the pa- patient population I'd been caring for all throughout residency. Uh, and Throughout residency at, at San Francisco At San Francisco General. General. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, with many of the same, but, but caring for women, I mean, my goodness, the, yeah. the, the stories that you hear and the reasons that they're there, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's very impactful. Mm-hmm. 
And, and so I, while I was doing this fellowship, I had been really doing a lot of inquiry and, and um, study, and, and so on my own before going into the fellowship, but it, it gave me the, I was really emboldened, I think, to apply some of that to the work within the prison and doing um, weekend mind-body-spirit jams. Like on my own time, I would do a volunteer project where uh, like probably one of the most meaningful things that I've, I've the most joyful, ecstatic, mean, meaningful experiences that I've had has been getting permission, which is no small feat, from the prison to to set up a, a mind-body-spirit um, morning for, for these women. It's and a jam. A jam. So mm-hmm. starting off, like taking them through, mm-hmm. you know, some stretching, some yoga, some meditation, self-regulation, mm-hmm. breathing sort of things, and and then progressively moving into, and all in a circle, you know, really going around and, and checking in with, with each other. How are they doing? And then just playing like some funky music mm-hmm. and like you know Stevie Wonder and, mm-hmm. and all all sorts of really mm-hmm. Parliament like mm-hmm. lovely lo- I I love funk you know to dance mm-hmm. to funk is mm-hmm. so delightful and mm-hmm. so much fun and so to have this experience where these women who are incarcerated who don't get to experience much joy mm-hmm. were able to just to just dance and mm-hmm. experience the medicine of dance mm-hmm. was extremely powerful Mm -hmm. um but then to to get back to your question you know how how did i how was i affected by Mm -hmm. andrew wiles program i i was charged as a bravewell fellow with the sacred task of really uh working to change the system to improve the healthcare system and and i think that that was probably what was most formative to have this to have the tools and all of this learning and the community of people who are engaged in this learning work and then to have to be tasked okay now take this back and and spread it and the strategic uh, objective really of Bravewell at that time was to have people within the academic world and to be to be push advancing it through different academic centers and so uh, I did spend some time at the Osher Center at UCSF and was invited to stay on and have a clinic there. But uh, my heart was in the community, and it was at the same time I was working part time with Coastal Health Alliance on my weeks that I wasn't in prison, mm-hmm. and um, I really felt this strong pull to be doing this work within the community. And I had, you know, I just had a baby and really wanted to be practicing in a community and ultimately really coming around to the fact in my mind that I I really think that for for us to really meaningfully impact the system of medicine the, the way medicine is is practiced and our healthcare outcomes I think that that to to bring it up to scale that that Partnerships, alliances with community health centers is really central. That this can't just be a boutique, concierge style, you know, five hundred dollars for an hour and a half sort of an experience. Because while that is beautiful, and I totally honor that that the the reasons that many people make that decision, and I've been presented with that option. For me, um, it, it's it's an it's a question of of access and service and scale ultimately. So um, so I think it's it's been deeply impactful for me to have have this information, this community to be taught by incredible beings like Andrew Weil. Mm-hmm. You know to, that you know he's he's done so much to mm-hmm. advance this way of thinking. Uh, that charged with and, and held by people who really believe strongly about transforming medicine has been mm-hmm. you know, very, very transformative for me. You know, it's, um, it's so interesting working closely with Ted Shetler on the Collaborative on Health and the Environment and our understanding that um, when we talk about transforming medicine, um, Everything turns out to be related to healthcare. So, for example, the food system. Let's mm-hmm. just take that as an mm-hmm. example. Um, 
I mean, the food system is just absolutely fundamental to health. And yet we have a food system that uh, goes out of its way to make people sick, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. you, can kind of, uh, you can kind of go through all different kinds of systems, school system, you know. Uh, again, um, my God, you have children at an incredibly formative age. But uh, the athletics part, the arts part, you know, they're all marginal, you know, they're sacrificed, you know, and the question of getting kids out into nature um, Mm -hmm. or getting them moving, Mm -hmm. you know, instead of sitting at computers. um, Mm -hmm. And um, so when we think about the health system, it just is so fundamentally interrelated to the, you know, I mean, we want to transform the healthcare system, but even if we got everybody into group sessions um, we'd just be a tiny fraction of the way right. there, you know. That's right. Um, and and um, and you know, health promotion, just uh, ways of living. And 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 the world makes it so hard to live in a healthy way. It just you know, even even if you're living in Bolinas, you know, it can be hard to live in a healthy way, uh, just because so many of these things. So. And you and I take walks together in the morning, which I really treasure. Not very often, and not as often as I like. But you know that one of the things I actually do since I had my own heart attack about 13 years ago is there's a place. First of all, we stop. We walk out Poplar and we stop. And we look from the place that I had the vision of Commonwealth 41 years ago. And we just stand and we send prayers for the work. And then we walk out to the end of Poplar and I do a few push-ups off a rock and I hug a tree, you know, which I've hugged ever since I had my heart attack. You know, I'm not a tree hugger kind of guy, but my heart attack, you know, made me decide that hugging this particular tree was a good idea, you know, which I've done on an, on an ongoing basis. <laughs> but you told me once that you had had a vision for a very long time about a healing center in a garden. Mm-hmm. Can you say more about when that started and what that vision is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, it's, it's so interesting to think back on this time, but as I was applying for and interviewing for residency positions, and I, mm-hmm. I just had this really this opening experience coming out to California. Mm-hmm. I did a, a couple of away rotations and really um, had these, this incredible experience of meeting now people who are, you know, my inner circle within my community on top of Mount Tam mm-hmm, and just mm-hmm. like this whole mystical thing. Mm-hmm. And and many of these people were had been studying permaculture. And mm-hmm. so I was exposed to this this idea of, of permaculture and bringing ourselves into alignment with. Uh, and actually, I didn't have a very, very well-formed idea of exactly what permaculture was back then. I was so mm-hmm. in the... You know, I'm applying for, you know, here's and navigating divorce and, you know, all everything that was up for me at that tender age of 27 when this was happening. But but I loved the idea of of this notion of being having a, a healing center that is grounded in the tenets of permaculture that that honors healing from the earth up, that is mm-hmm. that's built in you know, really honoring nature, that it's non-toxic and that people can go and actually just be in a healing environment and community is honored and, and classes are, and people are, are there to do healing work together in a safe, beautiful environment. And so uh, that was when I was when I was interviewed and people were asking me, well, what is your, what is your vision? What do you want to do, mm-hmm. you know, 20 years from now? What do you want to be, mm-hmm. what do you want to be doing? And, and my, it was like a mantra, like I would like to have a healing center grounded in the, the tenets of permaculture. And that is, you know, honoring of the earth and bringing people within this reciprocal relationship with the earth. And, and so, you know, that, that's really for me to have, have a place where people can be where they that they are healed, that they they learn how to heal their themselves, and that they uh, can go on to do healing work within their community just mm-hmm. by virtue of having the information, and but also deeply, deeply listening to and respecting the earth, mm-hmm. and having there be places for people who might not otherwise have felt empowered or know where to go that they can they can go and just 
know, sit and be in quiet reflection and be in relationship with, with the earth and where the food is grown and the herbs are grown and mm -hmm. to really have it be a demonstration site that, you know, mm -hmm. here's, and, and here's how you can be with the land where you're really light on the land, that you're, you're in a really respectful, reciprocal, loving relationship mm -hmm. with the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since you had that early vision and that was when you were about 27? Mm -hmm. So you've held that for some time. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it now, is it any clearer to you how that would actually work in practice? I mean, what what would a what would your day look like in such a center? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I I have a deep trust in the wisdom of the universe and mm -hmm. in this. Unfoldment, yeah, and, sure. and so that's what I'm, I'm actively listening, mm -hmm. you know, for mm -hmm. what that would look like, mm -hmm. and and as I come around to this idea of of healing in community and community mm -hmm. as medicine and nature as medicine, you know, for me it is, and and also honoring the importance of of my precious life mm -hmm. and and my precious family and you know that right. that I can't work another 30 years of seeing 20 patients a day right. I'm committed mm -hmm. to the primary care relationship mm -hmm. you know I love being a primary care provider mm -hmm. and I can't do it the way it's I can't do just that day in day out because mm -hmm. it, it is dangerous to my health frankly yeah. Yeah. Uh, but what I I really love is working with people in groups and imagining what it would look like to to have, be very proactive in panel management, as we say. Uh, that that how do we how do the, we have this this community that of this group of people that we're caring for? How do we how do we engage with them in such a way that they are empowered, that they are informed, that they are brought together in a in a healing way, so that. You know, they, they can be making wise decisions and that maybe, you know, a third or more of the office visits that we know, uh, that many of our office visits are directly related to the experience of stress, you know, or, or fatigue or feeling unsupported. So that if people are feeling more supported and they know that they can go to this community member or that community member um, to, to take some of that, that stress off and that they know how to nourish their body, they know how to be like, who's... Who is you know doing the walking group this week? Where's the you know uh, cooking group happening? Uh, people are really there's there's a lot of support around just self care and mm -hmm. and how to t how to nourish one's body that there are le fewer pressures on the system. But to answer your question, what my day would would look like? Mm -hmm. You know, I I would love to be doing a combination of depth work of programs. Mm -hmm. Like the art of vitality, with with I could imagine you know doing group pediatric visits, you mm -hmm. know where where there's someone who's with the kids who are are having like free tree climbing time while mm -hmm. the parents are mm -hmm. learning about you know different mindfulness parent mindfulness and parenting or how to how to uh, care for your kids' uh, nutritional needs or you know, various things, but within, like, developing community for the parents, allowing the kids to be um, having, doing what they need to be doing, which is out, you know, you know, playing and climbing trees and having their own experience and, and then doing, you know, if you could do a cooking demonstration, make it so that parents are really empowered and engaged and kids are engaged. You know, that any number of ideas. I mean, there are so many things that when, when you're thinking about within the container of, of nature and a garden where everyone is safe and they're held by nature and they're free to explore and free to, to just like get their hands in the dirt. There's so many ways that you could you could imagine doing healing work where people are just free to be natural beings and brought together and that you have the time to actually give people depth information. You know, there's a lot of community building that can happen. And and the intergenerational aspect I think is is essential. That, you know, we have we have lost 
touch, I think, in many ways with our modern society with the wisdom of, of intergenerational sharing, that bringing elders together with children, elders together with, with parents who are frazzled and, and who need some support. You know, there are ways that, that you could um, do work together where, where that wisdom is, is really um, drawn upon. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you spent much time with naturopathic medicine at all? I, I've, I've considered, I had toyed with actually doing an MD, ND uh, sort of a thing yeah. because it, it really resonates with me. Yeah. I just met with an extraordinary naturopath down in Tucson who's a, a naturopathic oncologist. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what's really striking to me is that, the, I mean, as with every other tradition, there are people who are good at it and people who are not so good at it. And there are people who are flaky and there are people who are less flaky. But, um, but, I was really impressed by, um, because I'm focused on cancer, you know, on, uh, naturopathy now has a, a naturopathic oncology credentialing program, and it's very thorough. Mm -hmm. And actually, the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, which are a, it's a big mainstream system, have naturopathic oncologists on staff who are an integrative part of their cancer treatment program. And it just strikes me, I mean, I'm, I kind of watch the world of integrative medicines and all the different subspecialties, you know, mm -hmm. you know, must be 20 or 50 or 100 of them. Mm -hmm. But it's striking to me that the naturopaths and the chiropractors are among the people, for obvious reasons, who have figured out professionally how to compete in the ecological niches of healthcare, mm -hmm. and that the naturopaths are um, are particularly good at the kind of medicine that we're talking about. I mean, obviously, some chiropractors are too, mm -hmm. and conversely, some naturopaths have just bought in totally to Western medicine and don't really do real naturopathic medicine. But mm -hmm. I just think about it because. You know, when we talk about integrative medicine as a model, this will take a few minutes to say, there's the Andy Weil integrative medicine, and then there's the Jeff Bland functional medicine. Mm -hmm. and, and you and I both know that integrative medicine is basically a lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm. And so Dean Ornish's lifestyle, basically mm -hmm. diet, stress reduction, exercise, and finding love and support in your life. You can reverse coronary artery disease. You can affect diabetes, hypertension, a whole bunch of things. And yeah. those are the things that you and I agree can go to scale in a major way uh, that should be part of the healthcare system mm -hmm. and so on. Functional medicine is kind of integrative medicine on steroids in that it begins to use a whole bunch of lab tests and supplements, both of which are expensive, mm -hmm. which may be enormously valuable to the individual or not. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, but in terms of going to scale, it would just recapitulate in some respects, not all, mm -hmm. a lot of the paraphernalia of mainstream medicine in terms of lab tests and, and pills and stuff. Mm -hmm. And yet, for those who can afford it, um, and it is the $500 an hour mm -hmm. version, and the supplements are expensive if you get good ones, mm -hmm. there's that whole route, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the ones that can go to scale, Mm -hmm. You look at traditional Chinese medicine, which is not necessarily expensive. You look at integrative medicine. You look at naturopathy. You look at chiropractic. You look at some of the systems that are already embedded and in place, okay. right? And you think about what would the strategy be to move a whole set of the scalable forms of integrative medicine together. Mm -hmm. Do you ever think about that? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things that I is uh, challenging to know how to hold is in when, when so much of what can be done is dependent upon what is billable yeah. um, to the insurance industry, and that is a bit of a political fit, football, as right. we all know. It's, it is hard to make forward progress. You know, for example, the Affordable Care Act, there right. was some really exciting language in there right. about prevention. And right. that, and so we are just kind of coming around to how do we get, get online with that right. when now there's, you know, great uncertainty. So, you know, I, I think that there's a lot that can be done within within the system. And then I'm curious about what, what can be done within the community and uncoupling the, the scalability from the reimbursable 
priority, you know? And so I, you know, I think that when you're, when you're thinking, I mean, this is something that's actually really very relevant right now is as far as, you know, do we, do we do groups only if they're billable to insurance? Do we do it if, if we, can we, you know, pay for, for my time if everybody pays just their copay and, and we don't have to worry about whether or not it'll be mm-hmm. reimbursed? And I think that there's real power in, in uncoupling. There's huge power in uncoupling. Huge power in it. And so, you know, that's that's something that I'm, I'm really curious about, especially when you're talking about, well, how, how do we eat? How do we move our bodies? How are we connected to each other? And here's the information that you need to make you, to be empowered around your decisions. Um, but I think, you know, for a lot of, it's it's not just as simple as that, of course. You know, we, we do a lot of, you know, there, there's some interesting statistics about, you know, probably about 85% of of healthcare expenditures are related related directly to chronic disease and and much of that is the downstream like the the like end of life end sort of life of thing. is huge <laughs> it's huge and so you know when you're when you're having a it's technical like 85 percent of medical expenditures over a lifetime or in the last year or two of life or there's some enormous mm-hmm. number like yeah, that yeah it's like that yeah, yeah and and much of which you know is is unnecessary right. and and uh, you know depending on I mean and everyone has to make their own decision but right. you know many people aren't really empowered around how they actually want to be exactly. cared for at yeah. the time of death and and they may or they may not want to be on machines for right. a few weeks right. which is extremely expensive um, but you know the other 85% figure is that you know over that within our healthcare yeah. system, yeah. you know, the three trillion that we're spending yeah. on healthcare, which yeah. is huge, uh, that it has to do with chronic disease management, right. you know, and and then outcomes there uh, from, and and a uh, much of that can be intervened upon. Yeah. There are many reasons that that we need, you know, the one-on-one visit. That we need the the technical prowess of Western medicine, and that we need to be consult. And, and lots of really wonderful ways in which we can be engaging with, uh, you know, acupuncture and with traditional Chinese medicine, all of which you know really does need to be billed to insurance, and so uh, in order to afford it. But I, I think. I think that as as far as scale in in these times of uncertainty, mm. I think that that it is really important for communities to be empowered and to take as much responsibility as they can, and for physicians and and other healers to be really stepping into their power mm-hmm. to be um, in defense of the planet and the importance of of you know being in connection with nature and the importance of the farm bill and food systems because if it's if it's just us you know trying to effect health for people, which, you know, as we talked earlier, it's a, it's a false framing to, to consider our health something that you can purchase from a, a physician or from a healthcare system. You know, it's, it's our own bodies. Like, we, we have to take care of our own bodies so the physician can't really take care of it for us. And so, you know, for, for us to really be looking at, well, if accepting that a physician can't really take responsibility for the craziness of our society and the the fact that we're all working way too much and that we're eating food that's not actually food and you know that we're not moving our bodies and that our system our our communities aren't really designed to be walkable or bikeable you know all of those things uh, we we are working against or trying to support people through and uh, I think that it's it's important for us to really be articulating that you know we we need to be working upstream. We need to be thinking more about societal level um, food systems and the earth and and you know everything that that we know goes into health. So so yeah, I think about it a lot, and I I don't know what the mm-hmm. answer is, but I think that you know just like with a lot of the conversations that we're having in these times of uncertainty and where fear is creeping in, that you know. We can show up for each other and really cultivate caring communities and and strong bonds within our local communities and and really work toward empowerment and yeah. taking as much responsibility as we can. I realize I did a disservice to functional medicine uh, in that I have many functional medicine friends who think about how you go to scale for low-income communities and how you go That's to scale true. in general. Yeah. So, um, and there are parts of functional medicine that absolutely lend themselves to that. But it is fair to say that it uses more diagnostic tests and goes deeper into supplements right. than some of the lifestyle medicines do. Uh, Patty Bradford's here. Patty, where are you? 
Patty, you, you were played a seminal role in creating the Coastal Health Alliance and, and uh, did so much. As you, as a pioneer of community medicine in West Marin, and you listen to this conversation, what, what does it evoke for you? Well, it, for one thing, it's, um, it's inspirational just to see where you're thinking about heading and also what you said about trusting in the universe and asking the question and just sitting with the question. And I also had a thought that um, the woman that I started the clinic with, Dale Johnson, I don't know if she's here, but uh, a lot of you know her. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for both of us, this was always our focus, too. How to how to have really um, heartfelt health care be available to everyone. And um, I bought the clinic from Dr. Donald Lance in 1982. And at that time, I remember calling the Association for Nurse Practitioners to ask if that was legal mm -hmm. to do. And it wasn't really clear mm -hmm. whether it was or not. I think the important thing for them was that you had, um, you could somewhere, in some way, say that 51% of your clinic was under the supervision of, of a physician. Right. So that's what we did, even though the physician could only be there a half day a week. Mm -hmm. But we were in close contact with wonderful physicians like Mike Whitty. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling like we're on the verge of really refining how to bring all these disparate elements together. Mm -hmm. I really like the part about how we're learning how essential the earth is to our own biochemical health. Yeah, you know, this is just fascinating to me. I remember reading the article in the New York Times about three years ago about the microbiome, which was the first time I'd heard about it. And I remember saying to my mom that this is going to turn medicine on its head. <laughs> it's just the opposite of the germ theory. You know? mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah, and, and speaking of the microbiome, and again, in the Collaborative Unhealthy Environment, uh, Ted Shepard and I and others, circulate a lot on the microbiome in the CHE integrative health list. And it comes back to functional medicine and integrative medicine, which is that the health of the gut is really central to the whole system. And so this whole renewed awareness of the gut and the interaction between the gut and the mind and, and so on and so forth is really... And especially the way that the microbiome can trigger epigenetics and that there might be a connection between our gut health and schizophrenia. Yes. This is to me oh, yeah. amazing mm -hmm. and very helpful. Mm -hmm. Ned Hoke, you, you've had a healthcare practice for a long time in integrative medicine, and as you listen to this, what reflections do you have? Well, I'm not local, so it's I can't. I mean, I'm local in the sense that I live here, but I don't have a practice here, no. so I don't. We don't have that right. element to it. Mm -hmm. that, but I am, of course, enchanted to, uh, as I've told Anna many times. I, I, uh, as she sings her song, I. I get. I, I I feel the enchantment, and uh, I didn't know that we were also. I grew up in Wyzetta, by the way, and uh, <laughs> which is a town right next to Edina. Actually, yeah, yeah, that's true. We have that in common, and also my one of my surrogate fathers was a man named Bob Gibson, who was the owner of Toro Lawnmowers. <laughs> <laughs> so I just by, just by the way, I, uh, <laughs> we have some connections, let's say. Love it. But, but coming back coming back to the topic of, of integrated medicine, I I've been um, discouraged. Um, by the language of, of integrative medicine many times because it, it's, it's, it's been so aspirational and, and has had so few legs. Mm -hmm. And so kind of being, now I'm sort of an older guy and having mm -hmm. been around a long time, I sort of despair that anything like Anna's talked about would actually come to be. And so even though I, my heart's there, I, I have... And some part of me has sort of given up on that as a possibility, mm -hmm. um, which is sad. Um, and yet, uh, oriental medicine is a beautiful discussion of the body as a as a part of nature, and so that the the teaching of the of the traditional Chinese medicine, as well as what's 
arisen from that teaching, which is now modernized by the Japanese and other people, um, we are able to do really remarkable things in terms of techniques. And, and, and so the idea that, I remember 1968 when it came to me that oriental medicine was this beautiful body of ideas and it was a sort of a solution in a way to mm -hmm. the missing thought that I thought our, my country had been invested in. Um, and I thought maybe this is, maybe we could scale, to use your word, mm -hmm. we could scale, and, and, that, um, and I was just lucky that I got to fly in the mm -hmm. places that I flew that, that took me to China and Oxford, England and various places to learn oriental medicine. And, and I really come to realize that we are part of sure. Not that I didn't know, but I also like, you know, I grew up in a forest and I was lucky that my father and grandfather had property right by where I was and and I crawled the trees and, and discovered God in the, in the forest. And so I'm so happy here that as Anna speaks that mm -hmm. others have had that same experience mm -hmm. and who are able to operationalize mm -hmm. some of that in terms of ways that I've never been able to manifest. I, mm -hmm. I, I work out of our office and people come in, I mm -hmm. give little bits of consultation and I put needles in them and they feel better, but <laughs> I haven't been able to do any of this, this building up of the larger idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I'm so grateful that you've taken this class, this, class, this class moment with us to show us that we could do this Thank together. You. I'd like to open it up for other questions or comments. If you'd say your name and keep your question or comment brief, we can hear from more people. Anybody? Yes? Go ahead. Okay, it's Bobby. Yeah. And um, I was wondering the magic of motivating people mm, to change yeah. their lives. What a great question. It's, it's a great question. Yeah. It's central. You yeah. know, that, that we know that, you know, only 10% of, of healthcare outcomes have anything to do with what a doctor or the healthcare system says or does. The rest of it, you know, comes down to behavior, decisions that we make about how we nourish our bodies, how we're held, and, uh, and genetics. But genetics, we also now that know that there's epigenetics, so we can actually turn on or off genes based again by our decisions that we make about lifestyle behavior. And so it's it's really central. How do we how do we motivate people? And so, you know, there's there's a, a technique called motivational enhancement interviewing technique, which is really, uh, it's, it starts with deep listening. Like where where is the person at? You know, is the person ready to change? Are they kind of pre-contemplation, meaning that they're not even thinking about changing, please, you know, don't talk to me about quitting smoking. I'm going to smoke until I die, you know, sort of thing. Or I'm thinking about it, you know, and, and so so recognizing or, or I'm actively, I'm actually in the moment of I'm ready to make the, the change today. Um, so so really listening and, and um, eliciting in the, the conversation, well, where are you at? And then, depending on where someone is at, giving them what they need. Do they need more information? Do they need encouragement? Do they need support? Do they need um, to have a supportive uh, friendship or peer relationship where someone who is going to hold them accountable? Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's really central when we're working within the art of vitality is that, you know, we're, we are, incur most people who, who have signed up for a program like, like that, or are coming to these groups, like they recognize something needs to change. They want to work on something. And so uh, so they're already in, you know, you're already much further down the road than you are with someone who, you know, is just there for a, a checkup and, and doesn't really want to hear from their doctor, you know. But um, but people who are engaged and present, you know, to, to be able to give them information and then to to you know I, I love using the peer relationship mm -hmm. so that they it's not the top-down hierarchical people will tell their doctor you know what they think their doctor wants to hear because they want we tend to want to please an authority figure and so you know stepping away from that whole and I, I try not to ever be in the, the hierarchical authority figure role but it's just by virtue of you know it's, it's there and so to really um, have people feel supported and open up to each other about where they're at. Like, oh, wow, you know, I, I know that I'm eating way too much sugar. You're eating way too much sugar too. Oh, let's, let's have a conversation. Like, what's, what is, and then the next step, this is really important, what's an achievable goal? That's not to, like, I'm never going to eat sugar again. I promise tomorrow I'm never going to have sugar again. But no, like, how about 
I'm only going to have a little bit of chocolate two days a week instead of five days a week, you know, and so that they can start to build on their successes and make small, achievable, specific goals or set these intentions and then be supported. So... So it's both within the, the um, Procholsky's, I think is his name, Procholska, Ski, um, who has done this stages of change work, motivational enhancement interviewing. Um, I don't want to say his name wrong, um, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but I think it's, I think it's, I should know his name. I think it's, it's Procholsky, right. it's right. it's but there's some beautiful drawing. work. You know what? Drawing. <laughs> Try. Just get it close. I think it's Pro- Procholsky. And um, that he's, but if you look up motivational enhancement interviewing or stages of change, there you can. There's there's beautiful science about how how we can help support people moving through the stages of change, and then help support them in maintenance of those changes. It's central. It's really central. But it takes it takes time, relationship, and deep listening, and so uh, that is something that you know empowering community around mm-hmm. and peer relationship or when you have the depth experience where you have that time it's hard in the 20 minute office visit you know I, I do what I can but you know it's when you know the time pressures are really challenging to that sort of work thank you you had a question? question go ahead yes you um, say yeah, your name please my name is Biko and uh, I'm looking around the room and I kind of I feel like my parents are here mm-hmm. and my parents have a lot of beautiful visions for the world and and not all of them were communicated in such a way that the youth embraced it fully and so when I look around this room and I see all these people who are interested in this transition and healing I'm thinking okay well we have 20 30 40 years and this is we're talking about something that's going to take generations so I'm just wondering like how do we how do we create in the scaling up more and more and more qualified people to assist in this, A, because it seems like we need thousands, if not millions of people who can, who can help lead, steer this trend. And then the other one is, is just related to the nature thing where we have a world where we live more and more in cities mm-hmm. and where the natural places like where we live are the exception, yep. not at all common. So how do we connect that? How do we connect the people in the cities to the type of microcosmic depth that we receive in nature? Because I don't think we can bring them all here. It's beautiful That's questions. True. Thank mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Anna, so I, I think as far as how do we how do we disseminate this sort of information so that, that it, it can be brought to scale and it doesn't have to be, you know, doctors doing all of it. That, that's destined to not be scalable or affordable. Um, you know, I, I'm doing, I just came, well, in the fall, I was at, at a conference, the Academy of Integrative and Holistic Medicine, which is a big tent. It is a really inclusive. It goes beyond the limitations I would saw at, at Andrew's pro, Andrew Wells program, which is it's all MDs, but that it's you know a, a lot of different practitioners of, of various stripes who are coming together, and there's there's definitely this this recurring theme of we need a new model. What's the new model, and how are we going to how are we going to do this work together? So you know that was a conference of people from around the country and actually around the world. You know. A, about a thousand uh, people, and so so that's that's a start. Like where where there's a lot of conversation happening. There are also a lot of uh, there are more and more programs now training integrative health coaches or you know health coaches in general that that have this sort of information and then are trained to to spread it. Um, and and I think. Personally, from from my view, I, I think that that the community, the network of community health centers, is really a well well positioned to help with spreading this. But I think also that that just whatever we can do to facilitate or to encourage a culture of wellness, that it's just you know the way we are living, you know that, and so changing culture. Gosh, you know how how do you change culture and how and what where are the moments like in, in time where there is enough. Uh, enough pressure, enough, enough challenge, enough, you know, uh, forces of <laughs> forces of darkness gathering uh, that where we all just need we have this real push to like you know cha- make a change. You know, I, I think that right now we're we're in a really beautiful time of opportunity for us to just like okay, wow, 
we can all, we, we need to make a change. How are we going to do this? And so, so I think that for young people and for cultural creative individuals, people who are, who are uh, leaders in, in culture creation, I think that you know, the more people who, who know how to nourish their bodies and to support each other in doing that and who just opt out, you know, just we don't have to rail against a broken system. You know, that's no fun. Like, as Caroline Casey would say, you know, hold up the mirror, like, oh, wow, here's how bad it is. But then, importantly, like, let's look through this window to how beautiful it could be and then just go there. And so turning away from certain certain ugly realities, like, you know, do we do we need to buy packaged, processed, refined food? Um, I think it comes down to affordability. You know, we we in West Marin are really very fortunate that we have you know we can make easily and affordably, and for the most part, um, choices about what we put in our body, and we have a wealth of an abundance of produce here at any mo- given moment. Uh, but it's not it's not always the case. So how do we how do we create really support a culture? And you know, Robert. Uh, Robert Wood Johnson, uh, they're really looking at this right now. They're shifting their funding priorities away from certain um, priorities like tobacco cessation and obesity rates, so important as they are, um, toward really looking at at how do we how do we support a culture of well-being so that it's not all on the medical system because that's you know we're not we're not getting anywhere with that. Um, but let's see here. So. Yeah, I I think that that's I think that that's a really important a really important. Question. But the second question that you asked about, uh, given that most people now live in cities, I, I think that that's that is really really important for us to be thinking about how to connect people. You know, when I when I was living in San Francisco. Fortunately, in San Francisco, there are a lot of parks, and and on a regular basis, you know, I I had a practice of going up uh, to my local park, you know, on a on a near daily basis to spend time in nature. So I think it's important for us to be able to uh, to find those little oases whenever, wherever possible and for people who are situated within urban environments to, to be really um, savvy in, in utilizing those resources as much as possible. But then also, I think, bringing people to have the experience is important so that they can have like a, a depth nature experience and then return and bring that, you know, I, it, it comes down to, I think, protecting what we have and not having many more losses in, in our natural wild environments. I mean, that's, that's a huge issue. Um, but accepting what we have right now, really, um, really giving people the opportunity to have that d- deep experience. You know, I think E.L. Of- e. Wilson has a new book out called Half the World Wild or something like mm-hmm. that, where he argues that we have to go back to at least 50% of the world wild in order to, to do this. Mm-hmm. Other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, connected, listening to you talk about your kids had me thinking of Rachel Carson's sense of wonder and how to connect, even if you're stuck in bed, KWMR has been reading Sound of a Wild Snail Eating, and I was hoping you had perhaps other titles to offer uh, in either direction. And let's hold your answer to that. Just That's a great question, and harvest a couple more. Jan, you had a question? Yeah, um, okay. I guess what, what I'm getting from this now is that, and, and it can come from the center, from the healing center, people like you who are professionals, mm-hmm. but there has to be, and I know this is in the air and it's in countless things that we can read and we talk about, but there has to be sort of like a coherent uh, empowerment of Mm -hmm. all people to realize that we are the healers. Mm -hmm. So that you may be, you and maybe the conductor, the doctors may highlight things, but we have to take it upon ourselves to realize that we, Mm -hmm. the people, are the healers. Mm -hmm. And if we take on a responsibility of being part of nature and letting our natures be part of each other's nature and accepting the fact that we have that power. And I think there's always been a tendency for us to look toward the specialists to save the day. Mm -hmm. And I think you're suggesting that the whole center can shift. This is the right time to think about that happening. 
where we are the primary humans right. and the doctors are the people who divine the that do the fine tuning if we do the tough work. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That's very general. And let me just harvest sure. one other comment that I'd like to request. Stephen Kate, who've come down, who until recently owned the magnificent Point Reyes books and are now involved in new adventures, as you community-oriented people from Point Reyes listen to Anna. Do you have any thoughts or reflections? Well, we're lucky enough to be one of six people in this room that are engaged in the art of vitality. Yeah. And it's been this perfect transition from being very driven mm -hmm. and sitting in that meadow across from the garden mm -hmm. and watching the seasons turn. Mm -hmm. The first time I've seen, taken the time to see that season mm -hmm. turn, mm -hmm. hearing those birds, hearing that ocean, mm -hmm. um, watching those trees, mm -hmm. watching that vegetation change has been absolutely remarkable and I'm so grateful that James and Anna have sort of created this opportunity uh, for us and my greatest hope is that Anna is able to establish the center at that garden that she envisioned. <laughs> Kate, any reflections from you? No, just to connect what Jan, to what Jan's saying too, it's a, it's a huge psychological, emotional shift mm -hmm. to move from seeing the healing coming from outside mm -hmm. and that I'm not, I'm powerless or mm -hmm. not, not um, empowered at least mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. my own care. And that, I think that is, uh, uh, I'm learning about it and I'm, and I'm really grateful for being held that way. And before Anna responds to this set, let me just take this moment to say, because I haven't been in the new school with Stephen Cade since you uh, uh, turned over uh, Point Reyes Books to wonderful new owners. I just want to thank you for 10 years of partnership with the new school in incredible ways. And to recognize that when you talk about community health, mm -hmm. what the two of you have done for West Marin not just Point Reyes, but West Marin, from the bookstore, from Point Reyes Books, in terms of bringing people together, um, I mean, using it consciously as a community organizing tool, it's really astonishing. And I know you're going to continue to do community organizing, but from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for everything you've done. You know, it's just really uh, special. So, So, Anna, you have a rich variety of thoughts, uh, and we'll probably end up uh, this and give our, ourselves a little informal time. Any kind of final reflections and responses to these thoughts? Well, I think, Tina, to your, to your question about resources for wonder, you know, I, there, there are, you know, any range of, of books that, you know, Stephen Kay could probably speak to. Uh, but I think as far as, as the experience of wonder, I, I certainly have been in the habit uh, as a very studious uh, person of, of going to books. But I think that there's, there's no comparison to just going outside and just sitting quietly and seeing what comes up. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as Steve was describing, you know, it doesn't have to, it can be a meadow, it can be, it can be the curb, you know, it can be anywhere where you're outside and just see, see who shows up, see what the bugs are doing, see what the spiders are up to, see what birds fly overhead. And it's incredible when, when the, the more practice one has with, with going, you know, I, I love going out with a question or going up with something that I'm, I'm sitting with. And just seeing what happens, like how, how the moving water soothes whatever I'm experiencing. And, and just the, the experience of going out and opening yourself in a, in a meditative, like just curious, appreciative state, will, it, it moves you. It's, it's, you know, it's deep medicine. So I'm going to refrain from um, giving you any titles and just encourage you that in, in the pursuit of wonder, there's no substitute for just going outside and sitting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Jan, you know, I think that that was a really a beautiful encapsulation of what, I'm, what I've been trying to, what I am communicating, which is that, you know, we, uh, we 
can be empowered to be our own healers. That, you know, the more that we can connect with our own agency, with our own voice, and with our own ability to care for ourselves and for our community, the better. And, and that is, you know, I think that that's essential medicine for this time. You know, rooted in love of the earth and of place and of community and of, of for each other in that relational way. I mean, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And, and such deep healing can come out of that. And that, that is scalable. That is scalable. And if we could just do that, if we could just use the power of love and connection and the joy of cooking together and eating our vegetables and, you know, feeling the sun on our face and the bird, watching the birds flying overhead, like all right there, so much healing mm. is derived just from that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just realized, Marianne Weber, you're sitting with us and you, you've played such a key role in Santre and the healing arts at Commonweal. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you are a great lover of nature. Any reflections as you've listened to this? Just as you asked this question, what came to me is to incredible gratitude that this is happening, number mm -hmm. one. But we're talking about, Anna's talking about elemental healing, mm -hmm. which is a subject I feel deeply about, you know, the heart and spirit, earth, community. The Navajos knew about that many moons ago. Uh, I'm just so glad that, that that's coming uh, forward. It, it's so simple and so essential that we could miss it. <laughs> and so the more directly we can be communicating to our hearts, to the earth, to community, the simple, basic things, um, boy, anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need models of that, mm -hmm. and thank you for that. And, um, and creativity comes up from that, and creativity and healing are, are one force. Mm -hmm. And so dropping the fear, letting that come together, it's, it's so beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anna O'Malley, friend, physician, um, practitioner of essential medicine, as Marianne says. Uh, I know that you're going to be a force in our community for a very long time to come. And I'm so grateful that you're part of the Commonweal community and doing work in the garden with us. And thank you for being with us at the New School. Thank you. Thank you.